and welcome to Money Talks, a show that has a very simple goal, and that's to make you richer. On tonight's show, Julia Lee shows us a trick to find great stocks using factor investing strategies. Then, Napoleon Purtis gives us his version of what happened to his successful makeup empire after going into voluntary administration. But first, we hear from Mark Bruce, the founder of Wizards Home Loans and Yellow Brick Road. Mark is a pioneer who helped put mortgage brokers on the map, and on doing so, saved millions of Aussies lots of money through lower interest rates. Now he's planning, I presume, to fight against the Royal Commission's recommendations that have the potential to decimate the mortgage broking industry. Mark, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks, Pete. Was I wrong in presuming that you're going to fight the Royal Commission recommendations? Well, there's no point in me fighting the Royal Commissioner and his recommendations, um, but I think the most important thing is actually to be able to talk sense to the government. Yeah about the implications of what the Royal Commission has recommended in relation to mortgage brokers only. Well, government and Labor, because Labor could be your potential um, government as well. Totally. Well, if I have reached out to Labor at this stage, I haven't had an opportunity to speak with them, but um, right now I am, but I am speaking to the, the Coalition, or yeah. certainly the Liberal Party. OK. What's your feeling? Do you think the government understands the important role that mortgage brokers have played in making the whole loan market so much more competitive than it was, say, in 1990 or so before you and pe people like John Simon got in there and changed things? I absolutely do think the Liberal Party, and in particular the Prime Minister, because he was a treasurer at one stage, mm. and, uh, and Josh Friedberg definitely, um, they both understand the importance of the role of the intermediary, that is, the mortgage broker. Yeah. The mortgage broker sits between the lender, the banks, and the borrower. Mm. And you just mentioned earlier, John and I, John Simons and I, many, many years ago, we created this intermediary to get access to four borrowers, two funders across the country, not just to the one that down the road that you've always banked with, get them at the best possible price and in a situation where you, the borrower, don't have to pay anybody. Mark, do you, do you get a lot of whinging from customers about the fact that mortgage brokers get trailing commissions. I, I've, I've, I've used mortgage brokers, as you know. Historically, if, if they can shift me from a 4.5% loan to a 3.89% loan, I don't give a toss what they get. Totally. And if the rate's the same rate, I mean, it'd be different if um, the bank's adding some price on to it. would be different if a broker came to you and said, OK, Peter, I'll get you a loan and you've got to pay, and I'm going to get paid by the bank, but then you have to pay a higher interest rate. No, that's not the case. You pay the same interest rate whether you get it through me as a broker or get it, get it yourself at the bank. So why would you complain? Mm. I, I've never had anybody complain to us about that. I'm sure you're going to get some people who aren't happy about it, but yeah. generally speaking, most people... In fact, people, someone recently did... Uh, a finance broking uh, magazine recently did a survey on 500 customers of brokers, and 97% of those said they were happy with their broker experience. OK. So... The banks, most of the big banks seem to be coming out in support of mortgage bro broking. Most. Most. But CBA's not. I know Matt Common, and Matt, Matt doesn't. What, what, what's going on in his mind, do you think? Well, uh, I guess if I put my Matt Common hat on, yeah. um, and I've got to act in the best interests of my bank or yeah. the, my shareholders, um, I know that I've got the biggest distribution in the country. Um, I'm much bigger in New South Wales and NAB is. I'm much bigger in Queensland and, and than uh, ANZ is, and I'm much bigger than everybody else is everywhere else. So I'm the biggest in terms of distribution. So therefore, I need a broker or broker distributors less than the others. Mm. NAB is not that big in New South Wales, so they need distribution in New South Wales. Mm. Let's flip it on the other side. Let's look at from the people's point of view. Let's look at the customer's point yeah. of view. It's all about the customer as far as I'm concerned. The customers would like to get access to NAB, but NAB don't have branches everywhere in New South Wales. Mm. The customers would like to get access to ANZ, but they don't have branches everywhere in Queensland. So a customer does want to have access to a broker, whereas Common, Matt Common, that is a CEO of CBA, I guess what he's saying is here's an opportunity for me to close the market out and mm. take more market share, mm. which is fair enough. I'd probably do the same if I was yeah. in his position. Yeah. But I'm going to have to tell... Matt Common, then I'm here to push against that because yeah. I want to make sure that consumers, customers, get access to every lender. Were you surprised when Justice Hayne, obviously a great jurist, um, no, came out and said mortgage brokers get money for nothing? Oh, I mean, I, I think it's just, just a total nonsense. Mm. Um, I don't know how many mortgage brokers he interviewed because he certainly didn't interview my organisation. Mm. Um, I know they did a little bit of work on, through the Aussie group, mm. but generally speaking, most brokers did not get interviewed. My organisation, we make up of about 10% of all mortgage brokers in the country. 
nobody got me to get up there on the stand and explain to them how mortgage brokers operate. And nor did I hear him interview many customers mm. who had used a mortgage broker. And bear in mind, today, 60% of all mortgages written in this country yeah. are written by mortgage brokers. So I would have thought, that's a pretty big question you need to ask. Mm. And that's a, a quite a big survey you need to do to see whether these customers are happy with that sort of service. Uh, well, I think that's the problem with Royal Commissions, Mark, that they often focus on what's wrong rather than what's right with various industries as well. Well, no, 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 Pete, that's an interesting point. In his defence, this was a Royal Commission into the misconduct of banks. Mm. So he didn't really have to talk to mortgage brokers in because, his defence. Because, because banks, in a sense, control what mortgage brokers do, don't they? To, to a large extent, because we can't do anything outside of their credit criteria. They tell us what the credit is. I mean, I mean you, do get, you do get irregularities. You do get brokers rotting the system. You get, by the way, you get doctors rotting the system. You get someone rotting every system. Some lawyers to, do as well. Totally. Lawyers will rot the system too. Um, and, and I'm sure there's people in government who rot the government. But... Generally, by and large, there are very few complaints about brokers out there. History of trials. Tell us about it. Because a lot of people say, oh, they're getting money after, after, after five or six years. They're still getting money. What's the history of trials? The history of trials goes like this. Back in the early 90s, if you wanted to borrow money and you went to a broker, you paid the broker and you paid the broker all the money up front. Mm -hmm. During that period, and major bankers controlled everything, during that period, people like myself and John found that there were a number of banks, one in particular, for example, that I know of, I remember clearly, it was called the Primary Industry Bank of Australia, PIBA, and it had no outlets. But they needed to lend money, a bit like our regional banks do today, they needed to lend money to every, people in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and other parts of Australia. So John went along to them and started brokering loans for Primary Industry Bank of Australia and a lot of these more unusual sorts of banks. Mm. And he said to them, look, our borrowers aren't going to pay me, him, a, an upfront fee when they've never heard of you. Yeah. So if you, want them, if you want me to encourage them to borrow money from you, make an application to you to borrow your money because they've never heard of you, you better take the money away, take away their obligation for these borrowers to have to pay me. And you pay me. Hmm. And as a result of that, all the banks started paying us. They started paying us, the brokers. And guess what happened? The banks didn't like the fact we're all getting paid up front by the banks to put a loan into their books or put an application yeah. into their books. The banks started seeing churn. So what would happen? A broker would do the loan, get paid everything up front. One year later, he'd go and churn that bank to another bank. So yeah, he paid again. a lower interest rate, help the customer. Help the customer and get paid again. Yourself. Correct. Yeah. And the system allowed for that. So yeah. the banks were smart enough, come along and said, look, we don't like this upfront payment deal. What we're going to do is we're going to pay you up front some mm. and we'll pay the rest over the life of the loan yeah. to encourage better behaviour by brokers and encourage better behaviour for borrowers and having better outcomes for the banks. Okay. That is where the trail came from. Okay, now, this is, uh, I can't what you say, you, you, I feel a bit like, um, you know, uh, Inspector Colombo. You know, help me out here. Um, the Labor Party, they're kind of connected to industry super funds and MeBank. Now, does MeBank actually work with mortgage brokers to get their money out? Because they haven't got branches everywhere. 100%. ME Bank or Me Bank, mm. they use mortgage brokers all the time. In fact, and, and they're on our panel. We, we lend a lot of money of Me Bank. Yeah, so small and regional banks, me, me, all, all these smaller banks who a lot of us love mm. and think that they get unfairly treated against the, by, by the big four. So if Labor doesn't support mortgage brokers, they're, in a sense, they're supporting big banks over smaller banks. Is this what you're saying? Yeah, and, and, and that, that, that seems to be the um, weird outcome from all this. Because this is a this is a royal commission into the um, yeah. uh, behaviour of banks, yeah. and uh, and people only behave badly when they've got power, mm. and the last thing you want to do is shift power back to the banks. And one way for sure you will shift power back to the banks mm. is is if you get rid of those people who've been keeping them honest, mm. and that's the brokers. Okay, now Justice Haynes thought it was a good idea that we consumers pay mortgage brokers up front. Now you've watch this industry a long time, Mark. How do you think we consumers are going to respond? You're going to say, stuff that. Yeah. So we'll go back to the banks. you go back to the of banks. Of a lot of big banks. And, and the brokers will go out of business. Mm. There's, I don't know, somewhere between 17,000 and 20,000 of these guys and girls, and they all, they're all average income is 80 grand. We're not talking about rich people. Sure, there are some wealthy ones in there, but not many. Maybe 1% yeah. of them are wealthy. Um, and the rest of them are just normal guys yeah. and girls. So they're, in a sense, they're small businesses. It's all small businesses. And I think Labor's actually put their hand up to help small businesses, haven't they? Totally. The and Labor's, Labor, Labor 
has said they are very pro pro business and or in particular small business mm. and especially where big businesses like the big organizations which are the banks because they've got big balance sheets they've got banking licenses and by the way i'm not here knocking the banks because i've got to work with these guys yeah. I mean, they're, they're on our panel i like the banks too i, I recommend my my clients invest in the bank totally and yeah. and, and we're tr we've got to balance it this is an ecosystem so the, the big banks have to work with the small businesses and the small businesses have to work with the big banks all of us have to work together i don't see the point in just changing the structure because I get very nervous about structural change and this is a structural change that has existed since the mid 90s that's a long time that something has actually become embedded into our system yeah. and you really say structural change you're worried about labor introducing changes to negative gearing changes to capital gains d discount and mortgage brokers at a time when the housing sector is in a, in a bit of trouble you're comfortable if they do it later on when the housing sector is nice and strong, but you don't want it to happen now. I do not. You're right, Pete. I, I have, I've been on the record for saying this for a long time. I'm not here to debate whether or not negative gearing and capital gains tax is a good or bad idea. It's not okay. the point. But if you, um, we are in a perilous position in Australia today if, and we are in terms of being vulnerable to shocks. Yeah. And structural change creates shock. Mm. So negative gearing, capital gains, they're structural changes mm. that they create shock. They've been around since 1985. Mm. So they can create shock. Um, broker, the intermediaries who give consumers access to money. So we're talking at lower about interest at lower interest. We're talking about liquidity yeah. here. And if we take liquidity out of the market, we've already taken a lot of liquidity out of the market over the last two years with the regulatory environment and all the Royal Commission stuff and everyone being scared about lending money. Or well, if you take more liquidity out of the market, there's one thing that's going to happen is the housing market's going to keep on their decline. I saw people talking about 20% changes in the next 12 months. If we see that, we continue to see that sort of change, Pete. The what issue will be for us will be will become GDP because house prices affects household consumption. Yep. And you know, household consumption is 60% of GDP. Mm. We do not need a negative GDP. This will be the recession we didn't have to have. That's what I'm worried about. Yep. And in many ways, this is a good chance for Bill Shorten to show us what kind of leader he might become. He has to be able to have the guts to back away from a policy he believes in for the sake of the timing and the economy. I think he firmly believes in it. But I think it's a matter of timing and it needs to be debated given the current circumstances. Excellent. Great to see you, mate. See you, Pete. And good luck with your battle with um, the government and Labor over mortgage brokers. Mark Burris, founder of Yellow Brick Road. Coming up after break this week, sector spotlight on stocks and factor investing. What does it all mean? Julia Lee will explain all. Coming up. Welcome back to Money Talks, I'm Peter Switzer. Well, Factor Investing is a strategy that chooses stocks on attributes that are associated with higher returns. I have Julia Lee from Bell Direct with me to discuss this very, very technical <laughs> idea. Can, can we all do this, Julia? I, absolutely. Look, Factor Investing has been around for a long time and it's about trying to generate higher returns mm. from your st stock portfolio. But what I think we are seeing is a renewed interest because a lot of strategies are now data-driven and technology-driven. So with AI happening at the moment... Artificial it's become, intelligence. Artificial intelligence about, yep. <laughs> happening at the moment. There's been this resurgence of factor investing. And basically you can look at economic factors or you can have a look at company-specific factors. Hmm. In terms of economic factors, it's trying to understand where we are in the cycle. So things like inflation as well as growth and interest rates. Hmm. And then on the company side, it's about strategy. So yeah, some Mix them or do you concentrate on one and invest accordingly? I like to mix, mix yeah. and match, yeah, um, no, because no. at different parts of the economic cycle, different company-specific mm. um, strategies work well. And I guess the strategies that we have academic research about, about that tend to outperform, these are things like momentum, size, value, and these things are perform differently at different parts of the economic cycle. So when you see growth in the economic cycle, it's usually earnings momentum that outperforms. Yeah. And then as interest rates uh, start to go down, it's usually the value side. So, and you, I noticed in your notes, you said that the ETFs are actually, how are they helping you, for example, pick a stock? 
Well, traditionally, if you have a look at ETFs, it's just followed an index. And yeah. the problem with most indices around the world is that they're size-based. So yeah. they're very much biased towards large-cap stocks. And everything's in them. If, like, like an ASX 200, there's 200 stocks in there. Absolutely. But with factor investing, it's trying to get away from using size as a guide to mm. uh, how much of a stock should be in your portfolio. Yeah, okay. And maybe using some other smart factors like momentum or things like cash flow, yeah. earnings growth. And are you say, saying some of these specific ETFs that might specialise as one called Robo, which is a bit, uh, uh, has robotics in it, that sort of stuff. If it's doing really well, does that give you an idea that maybe those sorts of stocks are in favour? Yeah, if you're looking at Robo, you know, the time that that tends to do well is when um, momentum and growth is very much in favour, so when the stock market is doing very well. But you'd expect that when there's volatility that hits, that it's going to hit the Robo area pretty hard because technology tends to be high beta. But giving you another example of an ETF, there's one that's just called ETF, so very easy yeah. to remember. Mm -hmm. And this one's based upon Morningstar's rating or the moat it gives a specific company. So it uses both qualitative as well as uh, quantitative factors mm. to give each company a moat and this ETF is uh, based around that. Okay, so you, we are running out of time but using your, all your sneaky little factor <laughs> investing, investigating uh, techniques, what stocks have you come up that look good? You can do this at home. So there's a whole lot of stock filtering services. So the one I've done is earnings per share growth, more yep. than 5%, cash flow growth of more than 5%, revenue growth of more than 5%. So very much fundamental factors. Right. And um, I've, I've come up with 39 different companies on that list. Good so we can God. go to your website to have a look at that. Yeah, and you wrote this scan. today in the Switch Report. Yes, I did. So if anyone hasn't got the Switch Report, free trial, 20 months, free free, you get Julia's story. And it's amazing. You can go back and back test these uh, type of scans now. So you can do it on the Bell Direct site. You can do it on a lot of different websites. Good. My pick today is Magellan Financial Group. Yeah. You've got the it's earnings momentum. Well, yeah, but not only has it been going well, mm. but it's also the outlook. And I like companies with new product offerings yeah. coming up because you have the possibility of new revenue streams. So Magellan has... Uh, has not only Ali, which is looking at a retail fund, which is Australian focused rather than uh, globally mm. focused, but also they are looking at um, new funds or putting together new funds to target retirees, which I think is a massive segment of the market. Okay, good stuff. So Magellan's the one. Was there another one there? I like Woodside Petroleum yeah, as Woodside, well in yeah. there. Um, so there are some large cap stocks showing some momentum at the moment. Earnings momentum, cash flow momentum and revenue momentum. You always keep us interested, Julie. Well done. Great, great story. And that, if you want to read it, Switzer Report. Uh, just go to switzerreport.com.au. Coming up after the break, we've got Napoleon Purtis. He'll tell us what in the hell happened to his really great business. Welcome back. Recently, Napoleon Perth put his business into voluntary administration. So what happened? Well, we'll find out for the man himself. Napoleon joins me. How are you, mate? Well, thanks for having me. Well, I've been, been interviewing you for years. Probably wasn't long after 1995 when you first ca you know, came on the scene. Big splash. You went to the USA in 2005 and you told me earlier that you, probably your best time was 2008 to 11. What happened to that, that great business of yours? You know, the US just kept eating up as we expanded in the USA, it was amazing. The volume was there, but the costs kept escalating. Mm. So in exiting the United States, there was an enormous, we were anemic. And being anemic out of there and coming back to reinvest, he made it more and more difficult. Okay. And as things became more and more difficult, the headwinds with retail here started because there's enormous liquidity in the market. Retail's really going through a change. Yeah. And it's not just the e-commerce thing. E-commerce is so still not like you're losing portion. business, too much business to, to online, but it probably just like a... It's the opposite of cream on the cake. It's, it just takes something away at a, t at a difficult time. That's right. Absolutely. I okay. that on the head. Why is there a problem with retail? If you try to analyse why... Yes, well, there's less people going into malls, number one. Yeah. Number two, um, the consumer now has a lot more choice. Mm -hmm. The consumer expects a lot more. And I don't think that we've been doing enough as a general retail environment in Australia to be keeping up to that aspect of making sure the consumer is entertained in the mall. There's lots of people still in malls, mm. but it's about 
you know, whether there's actually a want and a desire to actually purchase then and there. Yeah. And also, what happened to the malls where you used to go there on a Thursday and a Saturday and there was a centre stage with big entertaining and all of that. And experience is not Experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, experiences can't just be the individual stores. Experiences have to be a whole community. There's got to be a community. And I think part of that community spirit has been lost for some of the malls. All right, so we've got the internet threat. We've got um, people, uh, people are probably spending a lot more money on going out for food and things like that as well. But also at home. They're yeah. spending money trying to maintain their home. Uh, like yeah. all these interest-free, you know, um, these interest-only loans, yeah. you know, are now coming due, 650,000 of them. Yeah. So that's creating enormous liquidity issues. Yeah, and I wonder whether... Uh, like pay TV and Netflix and all this, people are staying home more and watching those sorts of products rather than going out to the movies where they probably have to wear makeup. You don't have to wear makeup when you're watching Netflix. Well, it depends with what you want to do when you're oh, watching Netflix. Okay. <laughs> oh, let's not go there. But look, uh, look, I think that the important point is, okay, there's all these struggles for retail. We know also wages aren't rising at the, at the rate that they used to as well. So when did you decide? It got too much and you had to go into voluntary administration. It would have been a terrible admission for you. You know what you like, you love your business and you love the way you've developed your name over time. What was the, the, the trigger for you to say, I have to go into VA? You know, with voluntary administration, there's not one trigger. Um, you basically uh, trade while you're solvent. And in that process, you know, you actually assess all your costs and your income. At some point in time, um, the, there was a decision taken that the business needed to take a breather mm -hmm. in order to be able to, to restructure and give the best return to the creditors. Mm -hmm. But I've just got to actually take this to a bit of a different direction yep. because we can discuss voluntary administration and this is all the yep. headlines that are out there. But one thing that I want to make clear is because I've been stopped by people on the street that have got basic businesses from like food shops to jewellery shops to accessory shops to everything. The one thing I want everyone to realise is that don't feel a stigma if you need to do this. Mm -hmm. It is available to you under Australian law to take a breather, to be able to have someone come in, you give them the keys to the home, yes, mm -hmm. but that allows you to kind of see what the best return to creditors are, looking after your staff, looking after the best chance of looking after your business to go forward. Yeah. And I don't want people to feel like the stigma. In Australia, we're a great country. Mm -hmm. We still need to be able to go for our goals, go for our dreams. There's so much opportunity. And, you know, in all this chat, we kind of analyse all the kind of micro details about around voluntary administration but for me the bigger thing is I don't want young people or business people out there watching this going oh my god it's all too much mm. you've got to do it and you'll make mistakes along the way yeah. and at the end of the day don't stop and don't feel stigmatized there are people out there that have gone through this, through worse, through better, and they understand the whole scenario. John Simon went through exactly the same thing. And you know, there were some statistics I read recently that in the top, in the BRW rich 200, something like 25% have been bankrupt and yeah. Yeah. Uh, at least once. And, and the important point from your point of view is the, the receiver or liquidator comes in and they actually see things objectively, but, which you might not see because you're too close to it. What's the possibility, the best possibility that that might come out of this process for you, your name and the business? What, what do you think could happen? I mean, we're absolutely working every day because when they take the keys to the company, they don't necessarily know how that business works. Cosmetics is cyclical. Yeah. Cosmetics, you know, you, you've got product development cycles, you've got retail strategy cycles, you've got channel channels that you retail in, you've got categories like from foundations to concealers to primers. You know, my job is to actually make sure that I'm giving, and the, the other directors, which is my brother and my wife, is giving as much information to the administrators as possible to take the decisions to maintain the value yeah. and as we work through that the opportunities are to make sure we come out stronger mm -hmm. leaner making sure that the brand has not lost value that's why it's important that the administration wraps up quickly yeah. and the law does provide for that mm -hmm. and that's actually really important so for me it's a about making sure that I work towards every day of my living breath during the day of advising the administrator on what it means to maintain value and increase value so that we're able to have a brand that my, um, to see it go to 150 years. Not because just for my children, mm. but just because Napoleon Potus has all the right DNA to do that. Mm. And the support from customers shows me that. Yeah, so in a perfect world, um, you might get some equity partners in. 
they will retain you as a, an advisor and driver of, of Napoleon Purse. Is that what you envisage happening in the short run? <clears throat> Look, there's about, there's about three or four different options. One is that you might get equity partners that come in mm. and actually want to drive the business, take it to the next level. Yep. The next level is not just growing within Australia, but taking it back internationally. We have a lot of opportunity there as well. Mm. The other thing is that you might actually put up a document to be able to actually use financial institution to help you fund your own comeback yep. as well. Yep. Um, and the other, of course, is to assess that you're actually the best option for the creditors is that and not to go through any path of liquidation. So keeping it tight and making sure that the stakeholders are really important. The most important stakeholders are, of course, the bank, you know, the staff, and you've got to make sure that you're actually looking after that. And we have had good support from our bank, and I'm actually I'm grateful. I'm not here to do any bank action mm. at all. Mm. They've been support, and I'm just working every day to make sure that we're steering it in that direction and, and looking at those options as we're kind of making things leaner and more efficient. Okay, you want to give that bank a plug? Because very few people say nice things about banks nowadays. Look, um, all I can say is that ANZ um, over the last Shane year... Shane, I'd be very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> ANZ over the last year have been working with us to make sure that we're able to sustain an iconic Australian brand. And Shane Elliott personally mm. um, has responded to me and I find that great because um, when I was watching last week what some of the other CEOs were doing, his personal response meant a lot. Mm. I know that the job is on the front line. Um, we're trying to make sure that we work with front line as much as possible. Yep. Of course, over the period of the last year or so, it's been a tough to and fro. But at the end of the day, I do have to say, ANZ has actually been quite good. Good stuff, mate. We're out of time. And of course, all of us are rooting for you. We hope you actually make it through and the brand name um, is sustained over time. Peter, you're the best. Thank you so much. My best. <laughs> My pleasure, mate. Coming up uh, next week, we'll be looking at some very interesting issues. And uh, I think you'll be very interested to, to know that we're going to be looking at um, this, the future of property, particularly in, in residential and also in commercial spaces. Talk to you next week.